Thank you very much. Uh, as uh, it was just announced, uh, I will represent here a European Processor Initiative project, which uh, started just recently, six months ago, and uh, it will be followed, this presentation, uh, by my colleague Mauro Olivieri from Barcelona Supercomputing Center here, who is going to provide maybe even more inside details. Uh, the initial idea, you know, behind my talk here is to give kind of like a wider perspective of the project and of the initiative and connect that to the topic that is, you know, uh, being discussed here today, which is the uh, open hardware and, you know, some of the ideas that we anticipated when, when we actually started this project initially and, of course, some of our uh, research and design uh, goals that we have. So to start with, you know, uh, what is basically European Processor Initiative? Well, uh, you know that, you know, some of the buzzwords that we all hear uh, at all times is like, you know, uh, uh, AI, automotive, HPC, simulation, cryptography, life sciences. Well, uh, EPI is, uh, is all about this. Uh, why am I saying this is because, you know, let me give some strategic uh, background on, on where the project was initially started here in, in Europe. And uh, there was, of course, uh, a large need for high computing uh, systems and, and being able to process a lot of you know, new algorithms that are you know, not only happening in the past, but also that will happen in the future. Of course, climate change is one of those, you know, you're very well known, all of you, you know, what are the problems in, a, in a, you know, predicting the climate changes. Uh, health is another, I would say, a very, very important topic because without simulation, without uh, being able to process, you know, new drugs and new treatments, we will not be able to uh, basically handle the aging population especially here in Europe, you know, where, you know, basically we are, we are uh, aging a lot recently and the cost of, of uh, health care for uh, older people is, is, is rising. So uh, also, you know, when we talk about materials, when we talk about chemistry, when we talk about, uh, you know, different uh, social aspects, then we all know that uh, it's highly necessary to do different kinds of processing, different kinds of simulations, and the need for processing power is rising. Unfortunately, Europe was not uh, in, in kind of that group that has most powerful machines, or it has only a few, and it was one of the core decisions in a change to dig digital economy to actually enhance uh, European uh, competence in the HPC, and also, uh, you know, we know that security, it was discussed, you know, in a number of uh, uh, topics, security is one important thing, but, you know, uh, industry competence and, and competitiveness in the global area also relies uh, heavily on simulation and, and processing uh, using HPC. One thing that is very important, you know, I have it here, Bottom on my slide, of course, this is, you know, kind of uh, uh, discussed all away uh, with all of us, is, is Huawei issue recently, where, of course, sovereignty is an important part. So if you do rely on, on some of the components of your system that you do not control, it's kind of uh, problematic looking long term. So Europe would like to, you know, keep as much as possible you know, it's technology in-house. Now, uh, how did it all start? Uh, well, it started actually a little bit more than two years ago where, you know, when in, in the Rome meeting, uh, some of the, you know, European uh, politicians met and decided that HPC is an important aspect of, of European future. And then, uh, you know, it was, si they signed something that was called European Euro HPC declaration that set kind of like a first steps towards creating uh, more compatible or actually uh, stronger and, and uh, more wider 
uh, HPC technology and, and uh, software support for the future. Uh, that led to start of uh, Euro HPC joint undertaking, which is basically a legal form uh, that, is, that is unique throughout the Europe that is right now responsible for, for carrying out that initiative in informal ways. And one of the things that, uh, it is, that is important to say is uh, European Processor Initiative is actually being controlled or overseen by this joint undertaking. Uh, this joint undertaking, the focus of this joint undertaking is actually to build the high-end, probably what we can say right now is state-of-the-art infrastructure, but also to develop the ecosystem. Because what we know is without the ecosystem itself, you know, the actual infrastructure per se is not really very valuable. Uh, what we can see here, this is a map of uh, all the participating states. And pretty much most of the European states already joined this, and, and this uh, activity has been uh, very efficient so far. Uh, why I, I made this kind of introduction is, is because, you know, here we can say where the European Processor Initiative project falls under this European strategic uh, activity. And also, uh, one of the things that we would like to do, of course, within uh, the results that we will produce is to support uh, investments into you know, future infra European infrastructure and global infrastructure using the technology that will be developed within the project. Now, uh, beyond the Huawei case that is you know, widely used today, there are a number of other you know, you know, topics and news and everything. Some of them may be fake, some of them are not. But basically what is important to say is that you know, being able to control the technologies is very important. But in the European Processor Initiative project, we go beyond that. Of course, uh, from the market perspective, when you look, if you want to develop, the, the core goal of our project is actually to develop the HPC processor families that will be uh, used for future HPC systems. But as we all know, the HPC market is not large enough to sustain this kind of development. So basically, if you want to build a, a solid ecosystem, so the, the actual uh, a company that would later on sell the chips on the market, being able to sell chips just for the HPC market would not probably be sufficient enough. So uh, what we looked at is how to actually develop also from the, the kind of like major architecture, how to develop some of the family members that can address some other problems on the market. And where we went with that is that Europe is very strong in the automotive industry. And automotive industry trying to tackle the problems of class four and class five uh, vehicles with, with uh, autonomous driving, they need more and more processor power in the car. And, and this is not just look like, you know, like uh, 10 or 20 percent more. It's an order of magnitude larger systems that need to be in the car being able to process all the sensors, all the visual and image data, light leaders, and everything else to be able to drive the car safely on the road. So being in, in the place where the actually we have very strong need for such processors, the merge of those two is kind of like a you know, win-win situation. So uh, as one of our goals is, what I will show a little bit later, is that some of those processors will be uh, tailored to automotive needs. But you know, what I can really say is that HPC is in the automotive for class four and class five vehicles. Uh, other than that, of course, we have you know, some of the other uh, server and cloud CPU needs where we can also include our processors later on. So uh, who is European Processor Initiative? 
Uh, so right now there are 26 uh, members or partners that are listed here. And what we can say here is that, you know, with this consortia, we really address most of the problems that face, that, you know, we face in order to deliver a complex product like this. Uh, what are, you know, our goals? First, as I said, to deliver, the, the primary goal is to deliver, to deliver HPC processor. Well, of course, now we have, now we come to the connection to this uh, uh, workshop is uh, we would like eventually to have our own architecture independent of maybe some other IP. Risk five is obviously one of the potential architectures that could be used for future generations of both HPC and non-HPC processors. And this is where we see, you know, our long-term interest in investing in the architectures that, that we discussed today. And of course, uh, you know, we are trying to include also some other cores in there that are, I would say, application-specific or maybe customer-specific that not directly belong to general purpose processing. Uh, our mission is, as I said, you know, to deliver the architecture, to deliver the actual processor, and to bring it commercially on the market. Uh, what we need to address here is not only to actually deliver the processor, but also to include it in some of the HPC systems into the whole ecosystem. So the project is led by Atos Bull, who is the, I would say, major European industry player being able to integrate the future processors into the systems and deliver, deliver that to the market. And of course, to address automotive market, as I previously mentioned. Uh, what we have here is important to say, this consortia is, uh, it contains not only academic partners, but it contains industry partners. And we are very closely you know, tied together in order to bring research to actual industrial product. Uh, also, as we can see here, we have the end users as well, especially from the automotive industry, that can bring the final product, integrated product, to the market, to the mass market, really, because the cars are really mass market. Uh, a little bit about the architecture. Uh, basic architecture, because I cannot disclose too many details, but basic architecture is built around general purpose cores. Then we have uh, MPPA, which is Calray Accelerator Core, Calray French company, EFPGA, so sp specific FPGA core that will be used for some of the applications. And what is important here in, in this talk today is EPAC, which is a RISC-V core that we are going to build you know, from scratch. Uh, the actual RISC-V core, besides having, and this is what Mauro is going to maybe give a little bit more in detail, so I'm not going to give you too much right now. The RISC-V core as well is going to have some of its own accelerators for specific application domains. So uh, it's going to really be higher, uh, heterogeneous and hierarchical design. Uh, what we are going to bring is a family of processors that are going to have, you know, different sets of, of those units depending on the target application or the target market. Uh, what uh, may be interesting is, is to say that for the uh, applications that are very important today, like AI, I mean, if you don't talk about AI today, then your presentation is not valid. So, of course, we are looking at the AI applications and how to enhance some of the key kernels for the AI applications. But that works also for the automotive because, you know, some of the algorithms in the automotive today, we still don't know where and how we'll be able to solve those problems that are appearing in, in you know, like, any day scene that appear in front of us in the car. So the, the, the amount of you know, processing that is needed is, goes beyond 
like the something that we can even say today what is needed to, to design a, let's say, a, a class 5 car. Um, of course, security, what was mentioned earlier, security is an important part of it, so it will be included in the architecture, being able to cover the whole aspect of the system, going you know, from the HPC system down to the you know, connection of some of the low-end devices that are being controlled. A little bit about the roadmap. So we are basically here. We just started six months ago. Uh, some initial developments have been made. And uh, we anticipate that we, are, we will start with RIA family, which is generation one processor. That is going to contain, in order to make things available to the market as soon as possible, we are going to, of course, include some of the existing IP. Because otherwise, you know, the development time would take too long. Uh, what we are going to do after this, we are going to try to develop the ecosystem, try to develop as many potential users, customers, or partners here, and then arrive at the second generation of the chip that is going to have more of our own IP included. And of course, you know, some of the IP that is widely used, like, you know, I don't know, PCI or something like that, that can easily be bought on the market. It doesn't make sense really to redevelop. But some of the core architectural designs are going to be, you know, designed by our own. And then, of course, we hope to get to the third, even more enhanced, enhanced family. Uh, from the commercial perspective, you know, uh, it started as a age 2020 research project. So, but you know, we right now moved under the domain of Euro HPC joint undertaking, and our goal is actually to move that to commercial company that is going to, you know, manufacture and you know, license technology and sell the technology on the market. Because, you know, 26 partners or more partners in the future cannot sell everything. Who is going to negotiate? Who is going to sell? Who is going to actually uh, contract the manufacturing? So, a special company is going to be formed that is actually going to be a front of the European Processor, Processor Initiative to the market. And what I said, Starting with those three, we plan also to cover some other areas of the, of the market as well, which are, you know, also interesting later on, but important is actually to make those first steps as solid as possible to create the momentum and, and to use it to, to move forward later on. Uh, just before my, my finishing slide, I would say that uh, the idea of including RISC-V in our architectural design was, I would say, one of the key things of the project because we truly believe that the RISC-V architecture will actually provide us with some of the kind of independence or sovereignty and we are going to be able actually to work on some of our architectural ideas that we have within the team to be able to deliver efficient, power efficient, energy efficient, uh, performance efficient, and, and hopefully price efficient uh, design on the market. And with this, I would like to conclude, and of course, uh, my colleague Mauro is going to provide you with you know, some more details later on. Thank you very much. Technological independence is a big driver for the European Process Initiative. Uh, Huawei found recently out that they can be cut off from United States technology. Uh, but uh, Synopsys and Cadence are US companies, and Huawei will no longer be allowed to use those US-based EDA tools. What EDA tools will you are going to use? Uh, 
I'm not allowed to say that, but uh, as we all know, you know, there are no other tools, right, than those major ones. Uh, yes, and it's a risk, but if, if you think that uh, you can create something without taking, you know, some risk or, or some risk when starting it, you would probably never start anything. So yes, you know, we are aware of that. Uh, we cannot reduce all the risks. I don't think it's possible today really in the market because, you know, some of the major players will, will, you know, will always be able to influence you. But at, le I, at least I think that uh, being able to kind of like offer a product on the market that is maybe not taking the majority of the share of the market, but competing on the market can bring the competition between the providers so that you can get either better terms or, or you know, try to get services. If you're cut off by certain set of rules, technologies, yeah, I mean, uh, we cannot control everything, obviously. Yeah. I absolutely agree with you. Yes? Along, along the same lines, are you putting even a little bit of funding towards the open source tool chains, EDA tool chains that are developed in your... I'm sorry, can you be a little bit louder? Mm. Are you putting any funding towards the open source tool chains that are being developed in Europe? Uh, uh, let, me, let me put it to you like this. We are right now negotiating with the you know, providers of the, of the tool chains. So I'm not really able to say any decision that, that we are trying to take right now. So it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Are you negotiating with any open source tool chains? No. Um, um, okay, so my question is, are you still happy with uh, choosing ARM as the uh, main processor? Sorry? Are you still happy with uh, the uh, choosing ARM as the main processor, since we see that the ARM is also now full of US technology? Uh, so far we are happy, yeah. Okay. Because, uh, you know... Because you don't have product. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but as I said, you know, uh, it's, you know, as a first generation to get to the market as soon as possible with something, you know, uh, we have, you know, uh, we are looking in that direction. Whether it's going to be ARM later on or something else, that's, that's uh, you know, our second generation chip where I said, chip that I said that we are going to try to, to shift to some other, uh, you know, IP as well. And the second question, so do you want to contribute back uh, something to the open source community? To the open source, you mean hardware? Uh, I think that pretty much so far we have the same view as, as it was said by Rick. Uh, we will, but probably not directly by giving, you know, the hardware back, but more contributing in some other ways. Because, you know, what we would like to do is some, some of the in-house things we'll keep in-house. 